My job as the pastor of this church is really pretty simple. My job description is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. My job is not to tickle your ears. It's not to leave you with a a warm, fuzzy feeling. Now, normally, you're going to leave here and you're going to feel better than when you came. But my job is to challenge you too. I've talked to you before about the Word. God's Word is a mirror. You look in a mirror to fix stuff about yourself. You don't look in the mirror to see how good you look. You look to see what needs to be adjusted, right? Isn't that right? And so when we're uh, looking into the Word of God, let it be a mirror to us to say, you know what, I need to, I need to fix this. I need, to, I need to increase. I need to elevate that part of my life. And so I love, I love what I do. I'm good at what I do. This is the call of God on my life. I don't say that to brag about me. I just say it because the anointing has to be here or this church shouldn't exist. We don't just have church because we need another church. There are thousands of churches in the city of Birmingham. There are dozens of really great churches in the city of Birmingham. This is a really great church. Why? Because it's called of God. It's ordained of God. We have a gift. We have a style. We have a way that we do church that nobody else does it like. My job is not to mimic. Not, we're not cookie cutter. We're going after the things of God that apply to us. Isn't that right? And that always comes from the Word of God. We'll always focus on that. Well, we've been studying about the seasons, uh, uh, signs and seasons. We started talking about the blood moons and just looking at the, the things that God's done in the, in the skies, in the heavens. Genesis 1, God said this, that He'll put the, the, the sun and the moon and the stars as signs, as banners uh, to all of us, as moeds. They're feasts in Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, and we talked about the first four spring feasts uh, three weeks ago or two weeks ago. Uh, there is an important aspect of the, the feasts of the Lord uh, that apply to the church today. The feasts of the Lord have to be understood to really get a grasp on uh, the prophetic implications in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. The four spring feasts that we covered two weeks ago uh, include uh, the Feast of Passover. And so we started studying that the week before uh, Easter. And then after the Feast of Passover, you've got unleavened bread, and then you've got uh, the Feast of first fruits, And then 50 days after that, you move on to Pentecost. In fact, we've got a, a, a diagram. If you could pull that chart up for me real quick. If you want to get a visual idea of what these feasts look like on the Hebrew calendar. Why am I talking about this? Well, because God's got a calendar. And His calendar is very different from yours. If you open up Outlook on your computer and you try to find the Hebrew calendar, it's nowhere to be found. Why? Because we live according to a Gregorian calendar, which is solar-based. We measure our days based on the sun and the, and the cycles of, of our uh, planet around the sun. But that's not how God measured days or measures them. God's people live by a lunar calendar or how many times the moon circles the earth, which is approximately 29 and a half times uh, per, per month. So on the left side of this chart, you can see the spring feasts, which take place in the month of Nisan. As you recall from the previous teaching, if you didn't, I don't want to spend too much time. You can always go back and, and, and listen to that on your own time. But uh, in Nisan, Nisan 14 was the day of Passover. And it's not because that was the day Jesus was crucified on. Jesus fulfilled what God started 1,500 years before that time. Isn't that right? So 1,500 years before Jesus ever died, God began something that He called a convocation in Leviticus 23. It's a, the, the feasts that he established were holy convocations. That word convocation means dress rehearsal. So God began a dress rehearsal 1,500 years before his son ever died. He established the pattern. And when Jesus came, and, and, and at the age of 33 and a half, and he showed up in Jerusalem on the Son 10, it was the exact same day that the, that the lamb was selected by the high priest of, in Jerusalem. And so for four days the lamb was inspected, and that led us to the the Feast of Passover 1,500 years earlier on Nisan 14. That very day is the same day that the Lamb of God was crucified. It's a beautiful picture into the genius planning that our God has. And it encourages me, because if He can plan 1,500 years in advance, what can He do for the next 15 years in your life? He's not intimidated by challenges. He's not intimidated by problems. He's a genius God, far smarter than anybody in this room, praise the Lord. That's why the Word says don't lean on your own understanding. 
and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your paths. So Nisan 14 is the Passover fulfillment. Jesus fulfilled it on the day. The very next day after His crucifixion was a day of unleavened bread. That was a feast, again, started 1,500 years earlier. And on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's the very day that Jesus' body was put into the tomb. That the the leaven, uh, which represented sin, was to be taken out of the bread during the Exodus. Why? Because they didn't have time for the bread to rise. So they ended up eating crackers. Their bread was like hard crackers. And we mentioned that the bread was striped and it was pierced. Just like by the stripes of Jesus, we receive our healing. And He was pierced for our sake. He was the fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Several days after that, between two and six days after that, came the, the Feast of first fruits. The Feast of first fruits was uh, the, the, the moment that the priests would, would wave the first uh, fruits from the barley harvest. This was the beginning of uh, harvest for the, for the Jewish people. And they would take it to the priests. So you'd take the, uh, a tenth of your, of your crops and you'd bring them and they would wave it before the Lord and they would declare that the harvest season has begun. Well, it was on the Feast of first fruits that Jesus came up out of the grave. Not near the day of first fruits. It was on the day of first fruits. These things are important. Amen. We don't talk about them a lot, but the feasts, these are called the feasts of God. We often refer to them as the feast of the Jews. And that's mostly because it was the Jews that typically know about them. But Leviticus says these are the Lord's feasts, the feasts of of God. So Jesus perfectly fulfilled the three spring feasts, didn't He? To the day, to the hour, He fulfilled them. Well, the very next feast after that is the Feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost is a word that we're all familiar with. Nothing scary about the word. It simply means 50. And Pentecost happened 50 days after first fruits was over. So first fruits is done, count 50 days, and that Sunday is the day of Pentecost. These four spring feasts represent a fulfilled uh, feast of God, the fulfilled feast of the Lord. They're done. Pentecost was where the church began. It was the very first gathering of the church. The Holy Spirit descended on the apostles, the disciples, and then from there the church grew and God added 3,000 people that first day on the day of Pentecost. It's interesting to note that the same, the very first Pentecost, when Moses led the children out of Egypt, was actually when Moses went up on Sinai, Mount Sinai, and he got the Ten Commandments from God. The exact same day. And that day he came down to the bottom of the mountain and the people were worshiping a golden calf. Remember that? And the Bible says that 3,000 people were killed that day. So we see the law was given, the very first Pentecost, and the law resulted in death. But then we move over to our Pentecost that was fulfilled 2,000 years ago and the Spirit was given and the Spirit led to life. The law, the letter of the law brings death, trying to do it right every single time. But the the, the Spirit of of, of the law of Christ Jesus, the Spirit of love, it brings liberty, it sets us free so that we're not bound to just having to live a life of, of rules, just obeying it just right every single time. Why? Because nobody can get it right every single time. We're human beings. We're, we understand that there are moments that we don't want to, but we have at least. We've missed it. But thank God that's why we're able to rise up and go again. Why? Because we are filled with the grace of God so that we continue to move. These four spring feasts represent the harvest, the beginning of the harvest. But I want to fast forward now towards the fall. And in the fall, the seventh month of the, the Jewish religious calendar was the month of uh, Tishri. Tishri. And so I want you to look with me in in the book of of, uh, Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to actually be reading several scriptures to you. And for the most part, I don't really want you opening it, looking in your Bible. You can can, um, leave that up for just one more second, Parker, and then we'll pull it down in a moment. We've got a lot of scriptures to cover, and so I want you just to kind of, in just a moment, I want you to kind of un- Unbuckle your seatbelt and just allow me to do the driving here for a second. Uh, in, in the book of Leviticus chapter 23, it says this, uh, verse number 23. This is again the same chapter that all the feasts are listed in. Leviticus 23, 23. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and He said, Speak to the children of Israel and say this, In the seventh month, that's the month of Tishri, on the first day of the month, 
you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Somebody say trumpets. A holy convocation. There's that word convocation again. This is still a dress rehearsal. It's still practice. It's still showing up and doing something that represents a fulfillment later on. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. This is what we call the Feast of Trumpets. Now in the fall, we see three feasts. And these three feasts represent the very end of what God intended to do on the earth. We finished the first four at Pentecost. That was the last time that the global church was together. Why? Because that was the first time they were ever existing was at Pentecost. Well, we're coming to a stage in life now, in history, where the church is going to come back together again. Amen. We have not received any marching orders since Pentecost. We, we read what's in the Word and this is what we're living. This is the age that we live in. The Holy Spirit is the one that set the churches up. He's the one that leads each and every one of us throughout uh, very challenging and difficult lives at times. This is the age that we're in. But there's coming a new age, a different phase. Why do we know this? Because the feasts of the Lord declare it. God has created a pattern. He's created examples for all of us to look to, not to have to guess at what is God doing, but to know what God intends to do in the future. God's showing us some things, and we're going to see this morning what He intends for us to understand from one of the fall feasts at the very least. I don't know how much time we're going to have to get through all this, but we're going to start with the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is on Tishri 1. Ten days after that, you get to the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was very important to the Jews. Why? Because it was on the Day of Atonement that the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, behind the veil, and he would apply the blood to the altar, or to the the Ark of the Covenant, and the remission of people's sins would be uh, announced. Their sins would be atoned for. It would be covered. Important day. In fact, for the ten days between Tishri 1 and Tishri 10... This was a season of great repentance. Now you and I, our our sins have already been atoned for. Thank God we don't have to deal with having our sins forgiven once again. Jesus, The Bible says Jesus made one sacrifice, and that was the last sacrifice that ever had to be made for sins. Now as we live our life and we blow it and we miss it and we fall short and we disobey light, we can go to God and receive forgiveness at that moment. But listen, the price that was required for your ultimate forgiveness, it's been paid. You don't have to carry the burden of, what do I have to do? How do I pay for this, this sin I, I have uh, committed? No, God's already done it. He's already been paid for it. Thank God. That's the gospel, isn't it? Amen. Gospel means good news. Have somebody say good news. Amen. So Tishri 10 was the day of atonement, the day that the priest would come out and would announce to the entire nation about three million people in the, in the, in the city's gates at this moment that God has received the offering for your sins. The last feast... The Feast of Tabernacles took place on Tishri 15, and that lasted for seven days. Now, uh, let's back up a little bit. The Feast of Trumpets. What does this mean? Well, remember what I said in the the beginning, uh, that the spring feasts, starting uh, in Passover, all the way towards Pentecost, represented the beginning of harvest. So the, the people would begin at that moment to go out, and they would cultivate and bring in the harvest. But... Once they got to the Feast of Trumpets, harvesting was completed. There was no more time to bring in the harvest. And so there would be trumpets, a shofar, a ram's horn would be sounded. And that would let the entire nation know that there's no more harvest allowed. Well, this speaks of something very important that we want to talk about this morning. And that's the rapture of the church. Guys, we're building up to something important here. God's trying to say some things to His church so that we're not caught off guard, so that we know biblically what God intends for us to do in these last days. I believe with everything in me that we're leading up to a great sounding of an awesome trumpet, praise the Lord, and that something big is on the horizon. But it behooves us, just like we'll see in the Scripture, to keep a watch, to stay prepared. Amen. Amen. It's important that we keep the future in mind in regards to, to, the, uh, to the rapture. Again, the Feast of Trumpets is, uh, is also called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah simply means the beginning of the year. Well, the head of the year. Well, that's a little strange to us because 
we mentioned, I thought Nisan was the first of the year. And that's absolutely the case. Nisan, around April for us, Nisan 1, is the first of the religious calendar for the Jews. But when we get to Tishri, they call it, the current day Jews call it the first of the year. That's the first of their civil calendar, their agricultural calendar. Basically, we do that here in this country. We celebrate New Year's on January 1st, but corporations all around us, they start their fiscal year some other time of the year, right? Just whatever's beneficial to them. So they measure differently. I know for the U.S. government, they start the year in October. So once October gets here, if they hadn't spent their money, their budget's blown and they got to start all over again. So it just that's a similar uh, outlook to what God had, uh, had, what the Jews had decided to do with their calendars. Tishri uh, represented uh, the head of the year, the Rosh Hashanah. And again, it was representative of repentance. The Day of Atonement, something called Yom, a day called Yom Kippur, which represented redemption. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, also called Sukkot, uh, was representative of rejoicing. Everybody say, I rejoice. I rejoice. Now, this is where I want you to just listen. You can go ahead and put the video back up there, uh, the live feed if you'd like, guys. Jesus fulfilled all the spring feasts to the day. We've demonstrated that after weeks of study. Would it surprise anyone that He wouldn't fulfill the fall feasts just the way He fulfilled the spring feasts? It shouldn't be a surprise at all. As a matter of fact, it's pretty much a guarantee that the days represented on God's calendar will come to pass defining what the end of this age looks like. There's not much time left in the hours of the harvest, in other words. And Jesus understood that. Jesus said this, He says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it goes into the ground, then it'll raise up others. Isn't that right? It'll bring more wheat into uh, existence. And then then Jesus went on to say, hey, pray that, that God would send laborers out into the field because they're white unto harvest. We are living in a day of harvest. That's what this life represents. Not just harvest for me, not just make more money, not just try to have a better house and and have more peace in my home. No, our job is to help bring other people along with us. That is the fruit of your life, your harvest in life. So the spring feasts, Pentecost, uh, from from Pentecost up to Tishri 1, or the Feast of Trumpets, that was the long summer. It was during that time, and that's the season we live in now. The first feasts were fulfilled quickly, one after the next. And then we had the long break between Pentecost and and trumpets. That's the season that you're sitting in at this moment. If God held His calendar up, it wouldn't be 30 days and 12 months, He'd say you are here and you'd be sitting right at the end of the harvesting period. The harvest is about to close. It's time for us to start wrapping some things up in our lives, to start refocusing on what really is important to us. And again, we'll prove this by the Word of God. So I mentioned to you in Leviticus 23, uh, verse 23, that, that the, uh, the day of Tishri 1 is the Feast of Trumpets. It's the Feast of Trumpets that represents uh, repentance. And for 10 days, from Tishri 1 to Tishri 10, the Jews would go and they would have a very introspective uh, days. They would spend hours upon hours looking over their past, looking through their heart over the last 12 months, getting ready for the Day of Atonement. Why? Because on the Day of Atonement, God would decide whether or not your sins would be forgiven. Thank God, once again, let me just remind you that we have already had our sins atoned for. We don't have to worry about, is God going to judge me based on what I did? No, what God's going to do is forgive you. Praise the Lord. He looks at you just like He looks at Jesus. That's what the blood that was applied to your doorposts represents. The blood applied to your heart represents redemption, freedom from death. Thank God for that. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul's talking to a church in the region of Thessalonica. And they're asking him some questions. They've asked him about the end times. This is 2,000 years ago. They kept thinking, any day now, Jesus is going to return And he's going to fix all this stuff. And so in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1, Paul says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Concerning the times and the seasons. In other words, concerning the feasts. We've already proven to you. Seasons, the moeds, the appointments of God. God has an appointment. 
And if you're not there when He's there, then you're going to miss something. He's showing this church that His appointments are coming up. Get ready to fulfill some appointments. Paul was talking to Jewish people here. And this is again why we must look a little deeper beyond our westernization. As a westernized pastor, as an American man, I see life very different than the way that, that God saw life to the people He had chosen in the Jews. Their customs are very different from ours. Their wedding ceremony, very different from ours. The, the way they would uh, spend their day, very different from ours. And when you read the Bible, when you read Scripture and you take things in context of an American's perspective, it's very different than what God intended when He wrote it. When these letter was, letters were written, they were written to someone that understood the culture. And so that's why Paul said, you have no need that I should write you about the feasts, about the times, the times and the seasons. You don't need me to write you guys. Why? Because you already know about it. You're familiar with God's calendar. It's how they lived their life. Verse 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Somebody say a thief in the night. Thief in the night. Well, once again... It's important to understand that the language that Paul used here is different from your language. This uh, phrase, thief in the night, was actually an idiom. Not, you're not an idiot. I didn't call anybody a bad name. Idiom. It's a saying. It's a, it's a way of talking. We have, we have lots of idioms in our, in our language. We talk about bending over backwards. Well, that, that might... Uh, someone that's a foreigner to our nation, they wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about. If you say... If you, if, if you talk to someone from a different culture and you say, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, they would look at you and say, don't you touch me. Uh, you leave someone high and dry or something came straight from the horse's mouth. That's disgusting. I don't want anything to do with that horse's mouth. Sometimes when you, when you let a secret out, you spill the beans or, or you let the cat out of the bag. Uh, take the bull by the horns. Sometimes we play it by ear. Or we ask the question, what's eating you? These are idioms that when I say it, you don't think much about it because you've heard it your whole life. Because you're from our country and this is thing, these are things that we say. Well, when, when we read Scripture, we have to keep that in mind. For me just to hear that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night and just assume that we can't really know what's about to happen because something's about to get stolen all of a sudden. Well, we, don't, we have to dig deeper. We have to be willing at looking at who is the audience that's being spoken to. Isn't that right? All right, continuing then, verse number uh, 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But Verse 4 says this, But you... Now he started out saying, You know yourselves, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Well, that's a contradiction to what he just said. He just said, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. But then he goes on to say, but you, you're not in darkness, so He's not going to come to you like a thief in the night. In other words, God's going to let you in on what He's doing. God doesn't ever just show up and, and surprise His people without preparing them ahead of time. That's what's happening right now as He's preparing us for some very important days. What does that mean? So, so what does that mean? A thief in the night, being unprepared. Well, there's some prophetic implications in that. In, in Revelation chapter 16, in verse 15, it says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Oh man, it's so confusing. What in the world does that mean? Here's that thief thing again. And, it's, and then it talks about nudity between a thief and, and, and somebody's buck naked. What, what is God trying to get at in this, in this Scripture? Well, what you have to know is the culture of the time during the temple. What was life like? Well, when God first lit the altar where animal sacrifices were made, it was never allowed to go out after that. And so until the year A.D. 70, when the temple was desecrated, the altar burned constantly. For thousands of years, the altar never 
went out. But somebody had to be in charge at nighttime of making sure that the fire remained stoked, that it remained burning. That person uh, was one of the priests. Well, you know, like I do, that when it gets late enough and you've been busy during the day, you might get tired. And so what happens sometimes, occasionally, is that priest would fall asleep while he was keeping watch over the fire. Now, there was a man that was the, the, the captain of the guard. And it was the captain of the guard that was also called a thief in the night. The job of the captain of the guard, as he would go about his, uh, his duties and, and, do, and do his rounds of, of, of protection, he would carry a lantern with him, because this is how they had light. And when he'd come upon a priest that was asleep, that was supposed to be guarding the, the altar, keeping the light uh, burning... If he was asleep, then the guard, the thief in the night, would actually light the robe of the priest on fire in order to wake him up. Well, of course that's going to wake you up. When he would be awoken by this, then he would strip the clothes off and be found naked. Why? Because he wasn't ready. He wasn't prepared. He wasn't watching. And that's what God's saying here in Revelation 16. Behold, I'm coming as a thief in the night. He says, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. God's not saying he's coming to surprise everybody when you're, not gonna, when you're least expecting it. All of a sudden the church is gone. No, he's going to let you know. He's going to give you some hints. But you must be willing to look at the culture. The way that he spoke to these people was not English. That's not God's first language. He spoke to them in a, in a different language. And we must study to see what He meant by these things. Now, over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, just if you're taking notes, write that down. Verse number 16 in the NIV, it says, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet. Everybody say trumpet. Amen. With the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will ever be with the Lord, or we'll be with the Lord forever. Well, you'll notice, first of all, the word rapture isn't found anywhere in this Scripture, not in our English vernacular, and really the word rapture is nowhere in the Bible. You can't find that word anywhere, so where does it come from? Well, we get it right here in this verse, caught up. That's the Latin word. When the, when, the, when the Bible was first translated, it didn't start in English. It was translated into Latin. And the Latin word for caught up is rapturo, which is where we get our uh, English word rapture. It means to steal away. It means to catch away. You know, if you have a, 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 a raptor, a, a bird of, of a raptor bird, and he comes and he takes things and runs off with them. Raptures is where we get the idea of being in one place and suddenly being uh, jerked away from that place. If, someone, if one of your friends was standing in front of a bus and you didn't want to see him die, then you would grab them and pull them out of the way, right? Suddenly, that's the idea behind uh, what rapture means. After that, we who are left and alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds. The Greek word for uh, caught up is a harpazo, which means to snatch, to take away, to carry off by force. Now we mentioned, or Paul mentioned to the Thessalonians, that at this time of rapture, there would be a trumpet. Right? Yes. We're talking today about the Feast of Trumpets. There's a connection that we'll continue to see as we explore this idea. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 51 once again, this is Paul. He's writing to Jewish people in the city of Corinth. And he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That means we're not all going to die. There will be a remnant left that never tastes death. We will, but we will all be changed in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye, when? At the last trump. At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. When the trumpet sounds, something happens. 
when the trumpet sounds. The, the key here is trumpet. Now, there's a couple. We've got another idiom to deal with in this particular uh, scripture. The first one is the phrase, in the twinkling of an eye. You and I just assume it's just a blink, and it's probably going to happen that quick. But when Paul says twinkling of an eye, we have to rewind and understand why would he use this terminology. Well, I've mentioned to us before over the last few weeks that the Jewish day doesn't start at midnight. It starts at sunset or moonrise. So tonight, when the sun goes down and you see the moon rise, for a Jewish person, that's the beginning of the day. So their day starts with night. It gets really confusing if you don't, if you don't spend some time thinking about it. And their day continues until the following evening when the sun goes down again. And that's an entire day, night and day, evening and morning, the first day. This is how God created everything. Then he said there was evening and then there was morning the second day. Evening and morning, that there was always evening and morning. And so that's why they, they, they do that. Um, so in their culture, the twinkling of an eye had a specific connotation. It literally meant a moment, a, a split second when it went from day to night. In other words, at the evening time, it's impossible for you and me to be able to tell. You know, if we're looking at the horizon, maybe we see the top of the moon, or maybe we see the sun, but maybe there's some refraction. You can't really tell by your visible uh, sight when it becomes, goes from day to night. or from Yeah, you can't see that specifically. But the Jews believed that there was a moment, and this is a moment that only God knew about. Only God knew the exact moment where it switched. And right now, it went from day to night. The twinkling of, of an eye, in other words, represents the evening. I want you to just keep that in mind as we continue looking at the idea of when the rapture might take place. In the twinkling of an eye, then Paul gives another thought. He says, at the last trumpet. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. At the last trumpet, the trumpet sounded for those that were listening to him. He's telling them when the rapture is going to take place. Literally, he's implying it's taking place at the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, for you and me in our calendar, is around the end of September. Now, I'm not giving you a year whatsoever, because I don't know what year the return will take place. But I can say confidently... Now, when it comes to, to Jesus fulfilling the spring feast to the second, He's not going to stop in the fall. The trumpet will sound from heaven on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, on this feast, Paul mentions the last trump. What does that mean? Well, there's, if, you've, if you've ever done any end-time study, uh, there are some people that think he's referencing the seventh trumpet over in the book of Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 11 which is, in my opinion, silly. Why? Because there were seven trumpets, but so people say, well, the seventh must have been the last. But listen, when Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, John had never written Revelation yet. There was no knowledge of, of what that, those trumpets would represent. Even if you did believe that, that seventh trumpet that sounds in Revelation 11 would literally be in the middle of the tribulation. And listen, God's not going to allow us to live through the seven years of tribulation we will be caught away. We're going to prove it in just a few minutes. So there's no way that the last trumpet that Paul's talking about here matches the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation chapter 11. So what's he talking about then? Well, again, consider the audience. Now, don't just take my word for all this. You guys get in there, dig around, study yourself, and you'll find out that what I'm telling you is true. There were uh, four trumpet blasts that took place during the Feast of Trumpets. There were four, four types of trumpet blasts. And the shofar trumpet was very important to the Jew. Why? Because it represented the covenant that God cut with Abraham when Isaac was delivered by the ram that was caught in the thicket. Rams don't get caught in thickets. They grow up around thickets. This ram's horns got caught in the thickets and it became a very symbolic way of relating between God and man. It represents that initial covenant. So now whenever a shofar, a ram's horn, is blown, uh, it catches people's ears. It... it, it Peaks their attention. Something's going on. During the, the Feast of, of Trumpets, uh, there were some specific ways that they would blow the horn. Now, the Feast of Trumpets took place over two days. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. It wasn't just a one-day feast. It was a two-day feast. 
And over this two days, they would blow the first three trumpets 33 times each. During, over the two days, there'd be types or styles of blowing. The first style of blowing, the first sound is called a tekiah or tekiah. And that's a three second sustained blast which sets up every shofar blowing series. So three seconds of sustained blast for three seconds. Don't put that on a recording, please. <laughs> the second blast that would take place 33 times in two days was the shevarim, which were three one-second notes that rose in tone. The shevarim, three one-second, dun, 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 three of those that rose in tone. They basically created the idea, the sound of weeping, of crying. Because you have to remember, the reason they're remembering these feasts is remembering what God brought them out of. They were all symbolic to them, and they should be symbolic to us. As Americans, again, we think we know everything, we think we got it all right. Look, if you don't know what God's said to His people, you don't know anything. And He outlines so much in His feasts, in His calendar that He established for the church. Three one-second notes. The, the third blast was called the Teruah. And that was nine short blasts. So they, it would literally be a dun 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 and they would blast that 33 times in two days. All right? Paul, Paul's audience knew that. But here comes the last blast. There was the final blast, and it, was only, it only happened one time in this feast. And it was at the very end of the feast, and it happened at twilight. It happened at the twinkling of an eye. And this feast, this blast, was known as the Takiya Gadola. The Takiya Degola, and that literally means the final blast. That means, it, and it lasted 10 seconds. And this was the blast when the blower showed off. They would have competition see who can make this thing go as long as possible in order to uh, create a message, send a message out to the, to the land, to the people. This was the exact trumpet that was used after a battle. And when the teams, when the armies would go in and they would loot the enemy that had been defeated, it would be the Takiya Godola that would be uh, sounded and that would call them forward to their new resting place. This is the last trump that Paul referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's coming a sound of a shofar that's going to call the believers to a new resting place, praise God. Oh, come on somebody, I'm, I'm preaching good here. Now we actually see this exact illustration in the life of Moses. Over in Exodus chapter 19, listen, don't, don't, don't open there if you, if you can avoid it. I just want you to look at me and listen. Exodus 19, 18. It says, now, my, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. God had descended on the mountain, didn't He? And there's smoke. There's a cloud, you could say, all around the mountain. Because the Lord descended on it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. Verse number 19. Now, what I'm about to read to you is a type of the rapture. And we're going to see very clearly how this ties in with what you and I have to look forward to. Verse 19. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded, watch this, long and became louder and louder. This is exactly what happened on the Feast of Trumpets when the last trump was blown, called the Takiya de Gola. Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. In verse 20, then the Lord came down. Everybody say, He came down. Amen. Upon Mount Sinai, on top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Somebody say, Moses went up. Moses went up. So we've got a cloud around the mountain. We've got the sounding of a trumpet, the last trump being sounded. We've got the Lord coming down, and we've got the man of God going up. This is what the rapture is going to be like for you and me. And He doesn't intend for it to be some great scary thing that we don't understand. He intends for us to know His pattern, to know His ways, to know how He deals with humanity, specifically with His people. But you say to, my, you say to me, but yeah, but haven't you ever read the Scripture that no man knows the day or the hour? So how can you possibly know when it's going to happen? 
Well, listen, number one, you'll never hear me dis- declare it's going to be a certain year. Amen. Why? Because I don't know what that year is. That's, that's true enough. But I do know that God's telling us and showing us exactly the time of the year to be looking for this. So what about this, no man knows the day or the hour? How do you get around that? Well, it's, it's easy enough. Look over in Matthew chapter 24. You can look there with me. You guys okay if I go a few extra minutes here? Yeah. Matthew chapter 24. How many of you want me to shut up right now? Okay, a couple of you. That's all right. Matthew 24, verse number 3. Jesus is talking to somebody here. It's His disciples. These are Jews. Is that right? They understand Him. Jesus is a Jew. He's raised this way. They have a certain way of talking to each other. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately. So they're just, it's just the inner circle. And they said, Master, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This is something that we've always wondered. Everybody in this room has wondered it at some point. Well, are we going to taste death or is, is the rapture finally going to happen? Generations have talked about this. I remember in 1988, you had 88 reasons for Jesus to return in 1988. Setting dates is not what we're about here. But we do want to understand God's message to His people. And He's shouting it very clearly next. He says, verse number 36. Jesus says, About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. About that day and hour, nobody knows. Not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. Well, this would appear to be a problem for some. But not if you understand that Jesus was using a very common phrase when He said, no one knows the day or the hour. This is not a mystery to His disciples. And I'm going to show you in just a moment that He was referring specifically to the Feast of Trumpets when He said this. Now, there were two things the disciples understood by this phrase, no one knows the day or the hour except the Father. Two things immediately came in their mind. The first thing was a Jewish wedding. There's a wedding in mind. And the second thing was the Feast of Trumpets. These were the two occasions where this idiom, no one knows the day or the hour, would be used over and over again, year after year. So it meant something. It wasn't just what you and I think. You and I hear it through our English uh, vocabulary, and we think, okay, well, there you go. So if anybody's trying to, trying to figure this out, don't worry about it. No, that's not what Jesus intended when He said it. A Jewish wedding was the first thought. And a Jewish wedding is different from our wedding. Our weddings, we get engaged and then we, uh, we hang out and sometimes people end up moving in with each other and just hanging out for a couple of years and maybe they never get married. But in a Jewish culture, the, the way that, that these men and women were raised, it was very different. There was a very specific path that a Jewish man and woman would walk in order to uh, finally, ultimately become a husband and a wife. And by looking at some of these clues, I think it will give us a very interesting insight to what Jesus meant when He said no one knows the day or the hour. First of all, uh, in a Jewish wedding, there was the the selection of the bride. And the selection of the bride was typically done by the father of the groom. The father would go and say, I want this one for my uh, son. Now, it wasn't as romantic as you and I enjoy in this day and age. In our culture, typically there's a whole lot of romance going on, and then maybe there's a marriage. But I can tell you pretty confidently that we're not doing a very good job at the marriage part anymore, are we? we got a whole bunch of people that by the year 2050 may not ever get married. They say in the next 25, 30 years, marriage would continue to drop dramatically. Why? Because there's no value in it. We don't see what the, what, we don't want to go through the hassles of all that stuff. And it completely disassociates, disconnects with what God intended in the very beginning. So the father would select the bride. I'm not saying dads go out and pick your, your, a bride for your son. I might try it and we'll see how it works out. I'll let you know. <laughs> but how many of you know that the father God selected you? In fact, Jesus went on to say that you didn't choose me, I chose you. Right. Amen. We've been selected, handpicked by God to join up with the bride one of these days, uh, for the bride to join, we at the church as the bride of Christ joining Him one day for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The bride was selected by the Father. The second thing that happened was the groom, the bridegroom would go to the bride's home. And when he'd show up, he'd show up with a contract. 
And this contract outlines to the, to the bride's father everything the bridegroom intended to do. This was how I'm going to take care. Like my dad, my father-in-law said, I'm going to take care, I told him I'm going to take care of your daughter. The bridegroom would show up and say, here's a list of things that I'm going to do to take care of your little girl. And isn't that what, what, what Christ did for us? That He left us His Word. He left us many very precious and, and, and awesome promises in the Word of God. When, when Jesus came, the Son came, He left a contract with us. A covenant of what God intended, what He intended to bless us with during our stay on this planet. It's beautiful. It's exactly what happened in our lives. So once the contract was received by the bride, there was a time where the bride had to make her own decision. Do I want to follow uh, what this man has brought for me? Do I want to, to, to accept what he is offering? The, the son would actually talk to the bride's dad and he would say, uh, here's what I'm going to pay you. Here's the value that I see on your daughter. And he would pay a dowry. Well, How many of you know you've been bought with a price? Amen. The price of the very precious blood of the Lamb of God was paid for you. So you're not your own anymore. Amen. That's a picture of Christ purchasing His bride before we were ever married. Yeah. So the, 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 the bride, the, the woman at this point, had to make a decision. Do I want to marry this man or not? And that's the decision every one of us has to make. God never forces Himself on you. He's a gentleman. If you don't want to, if you don't want to participate in, in the blessing and the cover of, of the covenant with Christ, then you can do whatever you want to. It's up to you. He's never going to force you to do that. And that's exactly what the bridegroom did with his, his future bride. It's up to you if you want to accept or not. The next thing that happened is if the bride wanted to accept the offer, there would be a cup of wine. And she'd walk up to the cup of wine, and she would drink from it. And if she drank from the cup, then they became engaged at that very moment. They entered into a legal contract. And this is the same place that J Joseph and Mary were at. Jesus' own mother... You remember that when Joseph found out she was pregnant, he wanted to divorce her, right? Why would you divorce her if you're not married? Because in the Jewish custom, once you're engaged, you're married. You're as good as married. You are in a covenant. And the only way to get out of an engagement as a Jewish man or woman is to divorce them, to get a legal certificate. So once the wine is drunk, that's the first cup of wine that's drunk. But there's another cup of wine that remains in the cup. And this is the cup of wine that's reserved until the marriage supper. At the very end of this process, there's going to be a tremendous party, an amazing congregation of people coming and celebrating the marriage. And it's at that point that they both drink the second cup. Now this is the exact same cup that Jesus refers to in the Last Supper. In, in Luke 22, 20, it says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Matthew 26 says it this way, I tell you, after supper, he took this cup and he says, I tell you, I will not drink from this wine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the cup that represented the, the covenant sealing. At that point, when the second cup was taken, it was not taken until the marriage supper had begun. That's why Jesus didn't take that last cup that He mentioned in, in Matthew chapter 26. The last thing the, the groom would do before He left was He'd leave gifts for His bride. He would leave her with things. Why? Because He would literally be gone for 12 to 24 months. He would leave her. Now remember, we're still talking about no one knows the day or the hour. He would leave her for 12 to 24 months. And so, as an encouragement, she would have gifts. And these gifts, she'd look at them and she'd think, I still got a bridegroom. He's still coming for me. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. He's coming back. And that's what Jesus did for us. He left us the Holy Spirit yeah. as a guarantee of His return. Yeah. That's the gift from the bridegroom to the bride. Come on, somebody. I'm coming back. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't get tired. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep on moving forward. And then the groom would depart. And he would tell her. See, the, as soon as he left the final gift and the groom would leave, he would be on his way somewhere. Where specifically did he go? Well, he went to his father's house. 
His father would typically have land. And the son would be responsible for building a home for the couple. This is the home that he spent all of his time working on. When he was done, he'd go to his father and he'd say, Dad, I'm done with the house. I want to go get my bride. The only challenge was is that he couldn't leave until the father inspected the house. Therefore, the son never knew when he was going to be able to go back and get his bride. No man knows the day or the hour. Not the son, not the angels, only the father. The father would go and he would inspect the house. And when the house was prepared, he would tell the son, go and get your bride. This is the season that we're in right now. Our groom has left. And he's been preparing a place for us. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come back and I'll take you to be with me so that where I am, there you may also be. This is a picture of what we're working towards. I read to you a couple of weeks ago that prophecy from Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland. And in the prophecy, if you'll recall it, he said, heaven is fully prepared. Heaven's ready. I believe the house has been prepared. It's done. Now it's just a matter of, what, which year is it going to be, God? The harvest is plentiful and it's time to go out and reap from God's harvest field. The people are waiting for us. Finally, the, or not finally, but the next step would be the return of the bridegroom. The bridegroom would show up. And when he'd show up, he would show up with a shout. He would show up with the blasting of trumpets. And this trumpets represented to, to the, the, the bride that was waiting that my bridegroom is here. And you remember in, the, in, in certain illustrations, Jesus talked about the virgins and some of them had oil and, and some didn't. And, and the ones that didn't have oil, they, they weren't ready when the bridegroom arrived. It's true that you wouldn't know the exact moment of the arrival of the bridegroom, but He always prepared the bride. He, they would, she always knew it's about this time. When He first left, she didn't know, but suddenly as it got closer, she knew this is the season of my bridegroom's return. And he would announce it. He would send a party out in front of them. And he'd say, I'm coming. Get her ready. Get her stuff packed up because the house is ready and I'm taking her home. <laughs> this is a picture of the rapture now. We've been taken up. We've been caught up. I believe once again, it'll happen on the Feast of Trumpets. The, the blowing of the horn. Isaiah 26 verse 20 and 21 in the Amplified it says, come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little while until the Lord's wrath is past. See, God's not interested in taking us away after a tribulation of, uh, of troubles. The bridegroom's not coming to collect a beat up bride. The bridegroom's coming to, to pick up someone that's fresh and ready to go. We won't go through tribulation period. There will be seven years of tribulation, sure enough, and it will be a terrible time on this planet. But as the church of Jesus Christ, you're going up. You're going to be in the, in the bridal chamber with the King of Kings, praise God. Isaiah prophesied it, verse 21 of Isaiah, Isaiah 26, For behold, the Lord is coming out of His place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. This is the Feast of Trumpets. It was a day... It was a feast of ten days of repentance. Why? Because the Day of Atonement was just around the corner. And it was at the Day of Atonement that you can't finish, you can't repent anymore. If anything was left, the Day of Atonement marked the, 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 the line in the sand. It's over. What you got is what you got. You and I get taken out before that tribulation hits. Just like in the days of Noah. You know, when Noah was, uh, was alive, we all have heard the movie uh, Noah. Out, I've heard you may as well call it Bob, as close to the Bible as it sticks. But uh, anyway, so Noah was Noah built an ark, and he, he took he took a hundred years to build the ark. Well, the ark is a type of redemption. It's a type of rapture. It's a type of salvation from a day of judgment. Isn't that right? In the in the days of the the building of the ark, Noah did not know when it was going to rain. What he did know is is it's not going to rain till my ark is done. It's not going. I'm not going to. Finish. If God told me to do it, He's not going to send rain until my ark is completed. 
And it's a beautiful picture of God's preserving His children in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I found you righteous in this generation. The rain hasn't started. And seven days before it comes, God warns His child, Go into the ark, because judgment's coming. Verse 4, Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. We are not going through a tribulation. God's calling us into the ark. Get ready, somebody, because God's about to bring judgment. Amen. But when judgment comes, when the, when the end of the harvest is here, we're right at the edge. When the end of the harvest comes, will He find you ready? Will He find you asleep? Will He find you watching or will He find you going about your life not giving a, a hoot about the things of God, about God's opinion in your life? We stay watchful. We stay ready. Just like those virgins were ready for their, the bridegroom to, to return. Again, we see in the, in the story of Lot. We know Lot. Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a very sinful place and there was not any righteous found in the city. And so he sent angels to the city. We, if you saw the Bible series, uh, you can see kind of a, a good depiction of what this judgment looked like. But as Lot and the angels are hiding in this room in the city, and destruction is about to be let loose on this place by God, Lot makes a request. And the, and the angels are there to protect Lot. And Lot says, look, don't send me just into any mountain. I want to go to Zoar, a small village uh, not too far from here. If I go to the mountains, I'm going to die with everybody else. Can I please avoid the, the judgment by going to Zoar? And listen to what the angel said. He said, very well, I will grant this request. I'll not overthrow the town that you speak of, the town of Zoar. But verse 22, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. God will not allow His judgment to touch His bride. Flee there quickly because I can't do anything until you're out of harm's way. That's how much the Father loves you and me to keep us out of that, that, that terrible day of tribulation and destruction. The last thing that we see in the marriage supper, the, the wedding of the Jews, is this in Revelation 19, verse number 6. As it were, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then verse 9, Then He said, to me, then he said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true sayings of God. No one knew the day or the hour that the, the bridegroom would go except the Father. And once that took place, once the bridegroom was allowed to go, he took the bride back up to the, into the heavenly places and they would spend seven days isolated in their wedding chamber. Seven days. Well, if you understand a day and year, the interchangeability between days and years, you see the time of the tribulation of seven years. The bride is with the groom for seven years while there's tribulation on the earth until the Day of Atonement, seven years later. It's at the Day of Atonement that you and I come back. This is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Different from the rapture. The rapture and the second coming are not one and the same. You and I are going to come back down to the planet and we're going to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years right here on the earth. Now, that's, that might be next week. I don't know. I'm not going to get into it today. I saw somebody just get their five loaves and two fish out. <laughs> oh, help me, Jesus. All right, I'm going to wrap this up right here. The Feast of Trumpets was the second way that the Jews understood when Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. That was a direct reference, once again, to the Feast of Trumpets. Well, the Feast of Trumpets had several names. You have several names. I am a dad. I'm an uncle. I'm a brother. I'm a grandson. I'm a husband. There's lots of nicknames for me, right? And each one of them describes a relationship from someone else toward me. Well, the Feast of Trumpets 
was a unique feast in that it had a lot of nicknames. And each one of these speaks to the, the type that God intends from this feast. It was called the Feast of Repentance. It was called the Head of the Year, the Civil Calendar. It was called the Day of the Awakening Blast, the Day of Judgment, the coronation of the Messiah, the day of remembrance. It's also called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what the tribulation's all about, by the way, is God dealing with Israel. God getting His people to a place of repentance where they'll come to Him and be born again. Isn't that right? That's what Jacob's trouble references. Jacob was Israel. It's a time of Israel's trouble. It's also known as the opening of the gates, the wedding ceremony. It's called the resurrection of the dead. This is what the Feast of Trumpets is called, the rapture. It's called the last trump. And it's also called the hidden day. The hidden day. What does that mean? This is where we un- I, I want to explain to you what it means. No one knows the day or the hour. The Feast of Trumpets was the most unique of all seven feasts. There were just seven. Remember that. Three, of, three times a year. The spring, then you had the Pentecost, and then the fall. Three in the spring one at Pentecost, and three in the fall. These are the three times that every Jew would go back to Jerusalem and and, and celebrate what God had done for for those people. But the Feast of Trumpets was unique in, in this. It was on the first day of the month. It's the only feast that's on the first day of the month. Well, what's the big deal? Can't you just look at the feast and tell tell when the first day of the month is? Well, you cannot. It's not directly understood. Why? Because the moon is how they measured their cycles, and the moon ran in 29 and a half day cycles. So there's always going to be a question of when is the first day? See, the the tenth day is easy. All you do is measure ten days from the first. That's why Nisan, no problem. Easy enough to find Nisan 14. Just measure 14 days after Nisan 1. Of course, Nisan 1, that made that very important. You had to know when it was. So how did the Jews tell the first day of the month? That's why this is called the hidden day. The day Tishri 1, the the, the feast of of trumpets, is known as the day that that no man or no man knows the day or the hour is another name for this feast. No man knows the day or the hour. Why? Because you didn't know when the first was going to occur. Why is that? Because it was always based on the moon. The first day of the month was a new moon. It was black at night. You couldn't see anything. And so the Jews had a custom. In order to establish the first day of the month, they had two witnesses that would watch the sky as the the old moon uh, waned. Uh, They would watch the sky and they would wait until the new moon became completely black. At that moment, they knew we're close to the first sliver of moon. And for the Jewish calendar, for God's calendar, the first day of the month was when the first sliver of moon would appear. And whenever that happened, guess what these two witnesses would do? They would go running into the temple and they would grab the chief priest, the president of the Sanhedrin. Not the chief priest, the president of the Sanhedrin. And they would tell the Sanhedrin president individually their account. And he would ask them, well, how was the moon shaped? And what side of the moon did you see? And which side was the sun on? And all these things. And if their accounts matched each other, then the the president of the Sanhedrin would announce that the month was sanctified. The new month has begun. Tishri 1 has begun. The problem is is that there was a two-day period before you'd know if that sliver was going to show up or not. It was the day that no man knew the day or hour. You couldn't tell. Now there's, there's Jews all over the place, miles and miles apart at this time. And how would they know when Tishri 1 started? Remember to them, this wasn't just another feast. It wasn't just another time for... for Dinner. This was their moment to begin repenting because the Day of Atonement's almost here. I've got to get my sins forgiven. It's a big deal. The only feast where the first day, the, fir- the first day of the month, was the beginning of the feast. So once it was announced that this day is sanctified, Tishri has begun, there would be runners, and these runners would go from the Sanhedrin's presence with, lan- with lights, with fire, and they would light fire on top of the mountains. And this lightning of of, of fire would spread from the east to the west. And as the fire sprung up, have you ever seen, uh, what's that movie, Uh, Lord of the Rings? As the fires started showing up, that let the entire nation know. It's Tishri 1. The Feast of Trumpets has begun. This was the day that no man knew 
the day or the hour. Only the Father knew. Why? Because only God knew when the, the moon, the first sliver would come into existence. Because the cycles of the moon were unpredictable. You couldn't tell. That's why this feast is also called the long day. It's not just a one day feast, it's a two day feast. And that two days was there so that you had time. If you missed the first day, then you could always wake up and catch it on the second day. The Feast of Trumpets, my friend, is about to be fulfilled. The end of these things that you're going through right now is about to be ended. Amen. All the, all the challenges that we find ourselves facing. I'm not trying to create just a pipe dream where you think, oh, I don't have to pay my bills anymore. Pastor Ball said, don't, y'all need to just quit paying your house payment. Hallelujah. <laughs> no. What I'm saying is, what if it was just around the corner? How much would you worry about tomorrow? How much would you be worrying about your challenges and your problems and, your, and all the things that, that bog you down? Instead, Jesus says, when you get close to this, He says, look up and rejoice. Why? Because your salvation is just right around the corner. We're about to be delivered from all these things. Yes, it's true that it's been a mystery to this point. But God is showing us very strategically His plan in the redemption of humanity in the feasts of the Lord. If you'll watch His feasts, if you'll watch His calendar, then you'll surely know that the coming of the Lord is just around the corner.